stress cell on stage and you look at the clock and that's 19 minutes into the class. Nice. It took you two hours to do a pre body diagram in the first class. So we're getting, we're getting better, yeah? The more you do it, the quicker you go. Right, so I'm going to roll through a couple of these pages and then we're going to do the rest of the board just need to talk about it. But it should be at this point now. Obviously, that talk diagram is upside down because the old convention when I wrote this particular example, um, I was using in is positive, but um, that doesn't make sense. So your talk diagram should be in the positive, not the negative. 2.5. But it should stop there. Tau, whatever it is, tau x 
Z alternating? Half of that, zero. Half, half of zero is zero. Not going anywhere. Uh, and tau x z mean, what's my mean? 12, yeah. 12.73 megapascals. Alright, so now I have that expressed, both of those stresses, I have expressed them in terms of A and M components. I might actually do away with this guy now. Understanding to do the graphs like that, or you can do something along the lines of. Should I split that in half? I probably should, mate. You can do something along the lines of a table that says you're drawing. I don't get how you do it, whatever works. So you can say something along the lines of fatigue, stress, and for every component of stress, you might have an alternating. And you can do something like over here, I guess, torque and bending. And you could also have axial load. Technically, you could have transverse shear, but remembering the transverse shear and bending are always you know, in opposite. You know, like Clark Kent, Superman, as it were. So, torque, our alternating tau A equals zero megapascals. Tau M, or it should be putting subscripts on it technically, is 12.73 megapascals. And sigma A is 67.9 megapascals. Sigma M is 0 megapascals. So, that's just what we've written there. That's just a different, quicker way of doing it. If you're comfortable doing it that way, feel free to do it that way. Alright. Now, what we can actually do is Obviously we've got four values of stress and it's not clear as to where an AM diagram or how we're going to do it. But we have this nice thing called von Mises. And von Mises actually allows us to combine a shear stress and a bending stress and get an indicative stress. Ordinarily we've just dealt with a static case of all stress. But now, because we're talking in alternating and mean components, let's talk about von Mises in terms of alternating and mean components and we'll get a representative total alternating and a representative total mean and then that A and M is what we can put on the AM diagram. Okay. So this is one way to do it. The textbook actually does it in a more complicated way and it does one license for the alternating bit and then it calculates the maximum principle for each of these components and then calculates the bond license on the maximum principle rather than the alternating, rather than the mean components. It doesn't make any sense to me. I have no idea why they do it that way. There's about four different ways that people use, so um, this is the one that I like, this is the one that I've seen most often. So just run with this until an employer tells you to do it differently. Cool. So, if that made no sense to you, feel free to read the chapter out of the textbook. There's a, there's a table that tells you what to do when you've got combined alternating means in different modes of stress. Um, you'll read it and you'll have no fucking idea what they're talking about either. Um, so <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but that's what they do. So textbooks are fallible, as fallible as people. Um, and so only ever trust them if you've got four of them that say the same thing. Alright, so if we calculate sigma dash A, that's just the square root of sigma A squared plus 3 tau A squared. We obviously, this is my component one, so sigma X squared plus sigma Y squared plus 3 tau, whatever it is. Yep, so it's in your textbook. This is just the component version, so I don't need to calculate my principles or screw around like that. Equals, now my sigma A, 67.9. Squared plus three my tau a blue zero. That's just this guy. And tau oh sorry. Sigma M. Same equation except I put M's on everything. And that equals 
mega pascals. If in doubt, put a 10 to the 6 on there if you're not confident that every single value that you're putting into an equation is a mega pascal and there's nothing that's not a mega pascal. Plus 22.05 on 400 equals 1 on n, and I rearrange that to get n equals 1.106. Is that largely agree with where I've put that line aside from the fact that I drew it poorly? Greater than 1 means we're inside. Conceivably, we're relatively close to the line, which is what n's telling us. So, okay. Alright, let's check the yield. And from yield, and we should expect yield to be more than that. Yeah, much, much safer according to yield. So the equation is sigma A on SY plus sigma B N on SY equals 1 on N. And now these are magnitudes because it works both in the positive and the negative. But if it was in the negative, we wouldn't have used the Goodman line like this anyways. Remember, because it's just horizontal for that, we just use the S SM one. 67.9 on 300 plus 22.05 on 300 equals 1 on N. Rearrange that, N equals 3.335. Alright, so that makes sense. Three? Yeah, so basically roughly three times safer, which is what that's telling us is once this blows line gets up here, Somewhere up here is our intercept. So the ratio of this, well technically that bit, to this bit. So three of these roughly gets you up to the yield line. Which, aside from the fact that my scales are completely askew, is, is pretty, pretty correct, yeah. So three, we're relatively happy with that just in a sanity check. One, we're relatively happy with that in a sanity check. And the very last thing you do, you've given me two factors of safety, but I've asked for one. What do you give me? The minimum. Okay, therefore, Goodman is more critical and M equals 1.106, therefore, not failing. I always want you to tell me what I've asked you to tell me. So if I've asked you for a diameter, tell me a diameter. If I've asked you for a factor of safety, tell me a factor of safety. <coughs> if I've asked you to prove that it's not failing, then that's a relatively open-ended question, and the easiest way to do that is give me a factor of safety that's greater than one. Uh, but you could just as easily say, we're inside the line, and you'd need something mathematical to prove that, therefore not failing. But most of the time, I'll ask for a factor of safety. Cool. All right, we've got a couple of minutes left. Oh, is there any questions on that? Is that you know, it's, it's a little bit more advanced than the last problem, but it's relatively straightforward process. It's just rather than it's fully reversed or it's completely mean, now you have to think about what the fluctuations on each component of stress are. And then if they're different, if they're the same, you just calculate one more minus value and carry on very well. But if they're different, you've got to do this on this table thing or draw them or add some some hybrid there on. Alright, I know you touched on the fact that we gave us the uh that SE that's the void set, yeah. The, that means we don't need to use this no five no five. Correct. Yes, yes. So I added that. I created this problem and then I realised that I wasn't going to get through it in class if I made you do all of those those factors. So I just gave you a different number and then I forgot to wipe that out for scanning it in and I've been too lazy to rewrite it. So um, that's that's why that says. Yeah, yeah, Cool. Alright. something that basically you don't need to know or remember. So, um, feel free to go to sleep. Now, so you guys are using the AS1403. We are now at a point where we can derive those AS1403 equations ourselves. Okay, so what I'm going to show you here is a simple form of that. It's not going to give you the same equation, but the equation is going to be really close. Um, and if you included all of their extra stress concentrations and axial loading and all of the other stuff that they put in there, you should be able to get really close to what their equation is, depending on which way they've gone, whether they've used my both bomb on these two and bomb on these two, or whether they've gone 
more wise to get the maximum principle, um, depending on which, which um, formulation they use. But you can see, even that shaft, that shaft was a complicated shaft, relatively speaking, it's been a quiz question before, but you saw that you did the same thing. Yeah. And so what was the first, effectively 19 minutes, I think I said, to get to stress element? was pretty much the same 19 minutes that you spent 20 minutes and then 25 minutes and then two hours on in every other time we've done a shaft. Right? That process doesn't change the shaft, so it's, it's silly to spend 20 minutes, half an hour doing that analysis if we're confident that we're going to get the same endpoint every single time anyway. And that's where someone writes a standard. All right, so the standard is there because once you're comfortable using the standard, you can actually do very complicated things very quickly and have a lot of confidence that you know, what you're going to do is, is right. So a few examples of it. So the standard covers a shaft that rotates, that has axial load, bending load, and torsion. And technically transverse shear, but the standard might we assume that, uh, that transverse shear is less than bending. You know, if you've got a shaft, it's a very, very weird shaft that the transverse shear is more critical than, than the bending stress. So they ignore the transverse shear the same way we do. Um, the three loads that you get in the standard are M, T, and A, or P, or whatever they call it. Um, I'm not going to put P in this. You can put P in this yourself, but we're, we're just going to do a fairly simple version. The shaft on the left there, obviously we have some forces, so that might be a gear and some bearings, and we have some torque. I think that's almost identical to the problem that you just did just now. And Aside from the fact that once again this is all the notes, so that should be positive, this is what that looks like every single time you do it. Yeah. Uh, and this guy is, uh, you have maybe a uh, bearing that carries actual loads, so not a self-aligning bearing, maybe a double brace roll or something like that that's actually carrying that cantilever. Uh, and so that's that bending moment and you've got some force on the end and you know, so maybe that's a pulley that's sticking out and just carrying and there's no bearing on the other side of the pulley or something like that. There's lots of different examples, but at every point we have some critical plane where we have a value of T and a value of M. So for this one, it's here, and for this one, it's here. And to get M and T, maybe you do do the shear force bending moment diagrams and so forth, that's relatively quick, but the standard allows you to not worry about the, the stress element. Because if we've got T, and we've got M, we know the stress element is going to look like this, effectively, um, or that shear in the other direction, and that bet you might be going into it. But it doesn't really matter when we're talking about actually calculating the one icy stress. It doesn't matter whether it's two compressive bending stresses and shears going this way, or tensile and shears going that way, because we just put a square on them and the, the sign goes away anyway. Okay, so that doesn't actually matter. But when we've got bending stress and uh, torsional stress, that's what the critical stress element will look like in the critical zone every time, pretty much, unless you've got other stresses, which we're not talking about. And sigma x is equal to mc on i, and in this particular case, what the standard talks about is using d as an unknown, using d as a variable, because the standard's not very applicable if you only have one diameter that you're allowed to use for the standard. So m's and t's and so forth are unknown, and d's are unknown as well, and they're all open-ended. So that's what we're going to do in this equation. So we'll carry D through and rearrange this till we get to 32 M on pi D cubed. You might have seen that already in, in the textbook. Same thing with torsion. TR on J just boils down to 16 T pi D cubed. And we're going to use these values for our stresses on our element. What's the next thing we do? So let's do static loading first because it's easy. What's the next thing we do? Quantum ices. Quantum ices. Yep, so we've got two values. Let's calculate our, our representative, our equivalent stress to all failure. We do that. Sum it into the bottom line this equation very simply. Bit of manipulation, you should all be comfortable with that if you're not having practice. And we get bottom line stress equals 32 on pi d cubed m squared plus 34, uh, 3 on 4, sorry, t squared. Easy enough. Now, for static failure, we know that bottom line is equal to sy on n, or n is equal to sy on sigma dash, you know, whatever you want to do. You sub that into this equation, so we have sy on n equals that. And now, the way that the standard's formulated is in terms of d cubed, because we want to calculate a d based on m and t. Rearrange, and that's what we get. All right. 
And obviously this is for static lighting, it's only for bending and for torsion, it's ignoring axial. But look at the form of this equation. It looks very similar to the form of the equation that you've been using in AS1403, right? So we've got d cubed equals something, which is what 1403 does. Then 2n, which is our factor of safety, which is out the front in that. Sy, which is out the front in that. And then we've got m squared plus something t squared. So some things on the inside there, which is exactly what we have in the standard. Right. And you can just as easily have, a, uh, have a, you know, a generic term for stress concentration in there as well and size factor and that kind of stuff and, and whatnot. So that's for static. For fatigue, the reason that you have four equations in fatigue is for the different versions of torsional stress. So we just did one where torque was constant and one of those equations in the standard torque is largely constant. One of those equations in the standard torque is, uh, so torque reversals. So that assumes cyclic torque, centrally located <coughs> cyclic torque. So when you calculate the A and M, you do it differently. Um, but this is just the example for a constant torque like the one you've just done. All right, so torque looks like that. Moment looks like that. It's exactly our problem that you just calculated, except maybe I've left off the torque here, so that's a bad three body diagram. Um, and then we do exactly what we did there, except now I'm leaving feet as an unknown. So the mean component of shear stress is that guy, and the uh, amplitude or alternating component of that is this, except because we know that the amplitude of the torque is zero, that goes to zero. Same thing, mean of the stress, mean of the stress, or the moment at that point is zero, so that goes to zero, and then this is just our value. So it's the same two values we use, it's just one's mean, one's ultimate. Same deal, one mysis, we get a mean one mysis and an alternating one mysis, and they look like this. We throw it onto our Goodman line for fatigue, and because we don't have an operation point, we need to do the load line, so we get the slope of the load line, and the slope of the load line is the alternating divided by the mean. And so if we have an alternating, and we have a mean, we can divide one by the other, and we get the slope as being 2m on the root 3t. It's just algebra, guys. It's not, you know, if that's confusing, you don't worry. You just put it, you can work it out yourself pretty easy. Um, and then we work out where that intercept is, including a factor of safety. So everything that you've just done, except now I'm carrying through m's and t's and d's rather than just putting hard values in there. So you solve for, let's say, a Goodman line equation and the intercept with that, so two lines. Solve for the intercept, and we end up with this. So technically, that guy divided by SE, that guy divided by SUT equals that. Rearrange, and once again, I've got an equation that looks very similar to my Australian standard equations, except this one's the fatigue one now. All right, so this is exactly the hand calculations I've just taught you. If you didn't calculate D, for the exact problem that you've just done, you can do it in one equation, no must, no fuss. That's why you write an Australian standard, or that's why you write a standard. A lot of companies will actually, if you do stuff over and over and over again in a company, you'll actually formulate one of these and throw it in a spreadsheet and then just use that ad nauseum. You won't ever be sitting there doing the same equation over and over and over again. You just have some bounds, you have some assumptions, you formulate something, you confirm that it works, and then you just use that like a black box. But because you're an engineer, there's no such thing as a black box to an engineer, you should understand the whole background and be able to confirm it. But that's how that comes about. Yeah? Easy enough? So I just wanted to give you a background in where those equations come from because it allows you to formulate them yourself. And it shows you that what we're doing in the hand calcs, what the Australian standard is actually representing, are exactly the same thing. It's just the Australian standard has a couple of extra little things in it. Cool. Alright. Thanks, guys.